Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Material Measurements. In this presentation, we'll introduce you to the basic technical concepts behind material measurements and the four most common methods used when making material measurements with a vector network analyzer. If you're not already familiar with network analysis, S-parameters, or VNA calibration, you might want to watch the presentations Understanding S-parameters and Understanding VNA calibration basics before continuing with this presentation. We can learn a lot about a material by knowing how it reflects, passes, and or absorbs radio frequency energy. This is helpful in traditional engineering applications, such as measuring the properties of a radome, a printed circuit board, etc. However, material measurements are also helpful in non-traditional applications outside of the field of electrical engineering. For example, monitoring the fermentation of beer, checking wood for signs of rot or termites, detecting breast cancer, etc. Using RF for material measurements has a number of important advantages. First, and perhaps most importantly, it allows for non-destructive testing of materials. In many cases, we'd like to obtain information about a material without destroying it in the process. Another important reason is that RF allows material measurements to be made while the material is undergoing physical, mechanical, thermal, or chemical changes. A special case of this is making in vivo measurements, that is, making measurements on living organisms and tissues. The process of using RF to make material measurements involves quantifying something called the complex permittivity of a material. So let's start by talking about what we mean by permittivity. As you should already know, electromagnetic fields propagate as alternating electric and magnetic fields. The propagation of these fields through free space or through a given object depends on two things. The object's permeability, mu, for the magnetic field, and permittivity, epsilon, for the electric field. The permeability of non-ferromagnetic objects is fairly uniform and is close to the permeability of free space. In practical terms, this means that a magnetic field is relatively unaffected by any non-ferrous objects that you place in them. On the other hand, permittivity does vary greatly by object composition, environmental conditions, and even the frequency of the field. So when we make material measurements, we want to measure permittivity because permittivity exhibits the most significant changes based on the composition of the material that we're testing. It's important to know that permittivity is a complex value, that is, it has both a real and an imaginary part. The real part is the so-called dielectric constant, which measures how much energy from an external electric field is being stored in the material. The imaginary part is called the dielectric loss factor, and measures the amount of electrical energy that's lost in the material. The relationship between these two values is sometimes expressed as the loss tangent, or tan delta, which is the ratio of the imaginary to the real part. When we make material measurements, these are the values that we're trying to determine. One way of obtaining these complex permittivity values is using an instrument called a vector network analyzer, or VNA. A VNA is an instrument that injects radio frequency energy into one port of a so-called network. It then measures the amount of power reflected back or received on that port, as well as power that appears on any other ports. The measured quantities have both a magnitude and a phase, that is, they are complex or vector values. Measurements are usually made over a range of different frequencies. One of the more common ways of expressing VNA measurement results is in the form of S, or scattering parameters. In the case of material measurements, these complex S parameters can then be converted into complex permittivity values. There are different mathematical or computational methods that can be used to convert our measured S parameters into complex permittivity values. The four most common conversion methods are the Nicholson-Ross-Weir method, the NIST iterative method, the new non-iterative method, and the short circuit line method. We won't go into details of these methods in this presentation, but a conversion method is chosen based on criteria such as the type of measured S parameter, for example, one port versus two port, the required accuracy, the required conversion speed, the sample length, etc. Another important topic when using VNAs for material measurements is calibration. Since we're not connecting our sample directly to the ports of our VNA, we use calibration to remove, or at least reduce, the influence of the measurement setup, such as cables, connectors, fixtures, etc. In standard VNA measurements, calibration is usually performed using a set of calibration standards, such as short, open, through, etc.
In material measurements, calibration is sometimes also performed using materials with known dielectric properties, such as water or methanol. Each of the different methods used to make material measurements have different calibration standards and procedures in order to obtain accurate results. The method used when performing material measurements depends on many factors. The first of these is the frequency range over which we want to measure. Some methods are relatively broadband and work over a wide frequency range. Others only work well over more narrow ranges. We also have to consider the physical properties of the material sample. Is it a solid, a liquid, or somewhere in between? How large is it? Can it be easily cut or shaped into a given size? The dielectric properties of the material are also important. Some methods work better on very lossy materials, some work better on less lossy materials. And of course, the desired measurement speed and accuracy are also important criteria. In practice, there are four main material measurement methods, namely the transmission reflection line method, the open-ended coaxial probe method, the free space method, and the resonant or resonant cavity method. In the remainder of this presentation, we'll provide a brief introduction to each of these four main measurement methods. The first method we'll discuss is the transmission reflection line method. In this method, the sample or material under test is placed in a section of transmission line. This could be a coaxial cable, a waveguide, a microstrip line, etc. Because we connect our VNA to both ends of the transmission line, we can make both reflection, or S11, and transmission, or S21, measurements of the material. This method is also relatively easy to calibrate, since calibration is usually performed with the normal VNA calibration standards, such as short, open, through, etc. Perhaps the biggest advantage of the transmission reflection line method is simplicity. It's very similar to the normal types of measurements we make with a vector network analyzer. This method also works very well for medium to high loss materials. There are, however, a few disadvantages to this method. First, we need to ensure that the sample fits very tightly into the transmission line fixture. Any air gap can limit accuracy or lead to measurement errors. This method also only works well at frequencies below about 10 gigahertz. But perhaps the biggest disadvantage of this methodology is that the samples must be prepared to a certain size and or shape to fit in the transmission line fixture. This isn't always possible, for example in the case of a liquid, semi-solid, or many types of biological samples. So how do we measure the complex permittivity of things like liquids, or materials that can't be easily cut or prepared into the desired shape? This is an area where the open-ended coaxial probe, or OCP method, works very well. In this method, a probe is essentially made by truncating a transmission line. This probe is then inserted into, or sometimes placed up against, the material under test, and a reflection or S11 measurement is made. The OCP method is a very popular material measurement method. It works best for liquids and semi-solids, but it can also be used to test some types of solids. Calibration is usually performed using a combination of the normal calibration standards and a reference liquid like water, saline, or methanol. As you might imagine, the biggest advantage of this method is the simple test setup. Just immerse the probe in the material to be tested. Compared to the transmission reflection line method, the sample preparation is quite easy and is non-destructive. No cutting or shaping of the sample is required in most cases. The OCP method works very well for both medium and high loss materials, and it's quite broadband. It can be used to test over a wide frequency range. In terms of the disadvantages of this methodology, it should be clear that only reflection measurements are possible. It's also very important that the probe be kept clean, smooth, and in close contact with the sample. Any bubbles or roughness on the surface of the probe will affect accuracy. And lastly, this method doesn't work well for low loss materials. The free space method is helpful in the case where we have an irregularly shaped or non-uniform sample that we want to test. It consists of two antennas facing each other with a sample holder in between. S parameters are first measured for the empty sample holder, then the material under test is placed in the sample holder, and S parameters are measured again. A special mathematical process called de-embedding can be used to remove or to cancel out the influence of the sample holder and determine the S parameters of the material under test. Note that the free space method can be used for making both reflection and transmission measurements.
One of the advantages of the free space method is that it can be used to measure non-uniform materials, such as composite materials, or irregularly shaped materials, such as a honeycomb or similar. It can also be used to measure samples in challenging environments, such as under very high temperatures. And this method is also suitable for very high frequency measurements as well. One of the disadvantages of the free space method is the sample needs to be relatively large and flat in order to be properly illuminated by the antennas. Using free space techniques also means that we have to be concerned about reflections between the antenna and the surface of the sample and diffraction along the edges of the sample. The resonant cavity method is almost the opposite of the free space method. Instead of placing the sample out in the open, we enclose it in a specially designed cavity or container. Know that there are many possible cavity shapes and designs. We start by measuring the empty cavity with our vector network analyzer. The measurement is then repeated with a sample in the cavity. The presence of the sample will cause changes in the measured resonant frequency and or something called the Q or quality factor. Permittivity can then be computed using changes in frequency, Q factor, and volume. Note that the resonant cavity method does not require a separate calibration step. The resonant method has two main advantages. First, this method has very high accuracy and sensitivity, especially compared to more broadband methods like OCP. This method also allows a sample to have very small physical dimensions compared to some of the other methods we've discussed. The main disadvantages of the resonant method are that it's typically limited to a narrow range of frequencies in the microwave region, and good results require a relatively low loss material. So in summary, the physical properties of many materials can be determined using a vector network analyzer. This is done by making precise measurements of how radio frequency energy is absorbed, passed, and reflected by the material under test. Using RF allows non-destructive testing under a wide range of conditions and for many different types of materials. A vector network analyzer generates results in the form of S parameters, which can then be converted to complex permittivity values using various computational methods. We also look briefly at each of the four main material measurement methods, namely the transmission reflection line method, the open-ended coaxial probe method, the free space method, and the resonant or resonant cavity method. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Material Measurements. Thanks for watching.